During our summer scouting series, we have discussed numerous skill positions at Ohio State and how they might fare as draft picks in the National Football League. But we're not done yet. Kate Stover and Julian Fleming are next. Summer scouting continues right here on Locked on Buckeyes. You are Locked on Buckeyes, your daily podcast on the Ohio State Buckeyes. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, Buckeyes fans? Welcome back to another episode of Locked on Buckeyes for the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jay Stevens, also the host of the Jay Stevens Podcast. It is Monday, July the 3rd in the year 2023. And this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to Get started. During today's episode, Ryan Roberts is with us once again. He is my favorite NFL draft analyst, and he is one of the co-hosts of the First Team Podcast. You can hear wherever you get your fine podcast. Ryan's back once again, and Ryan and I have discussed and done some summer scouting NFL draft projections for Mayan Williams, Travion Henderson, also the receivers at Ohio State, Marvin Harrison Jr., Ameka Abuka. But there's another receiver we haven't touched on. There's a tight end who's really talented as well. Didn't do a quarterback this offseason because I don't know who the starting quarterback is going to be. And two, even if we did, I don't believe there's enough film to project what they would be as draft picks in the upcoming offseason. So we didn't do a quarterback this year. That probably will come in the upcoming offseason. But today's about Fleming. Today's about Stover. Ryan, before we get to those two players, how are you doing, man? Life's been busy for both of us. It's been very busy, man. I, I would actually say it's been m- maybe busier for you, though. I mean, uh, you know, getting married and such is a pretty big deal. But uh, everything's good, man. Everything's good. We're just winding down and starting to get into the bulk of summer now. So everything's good over here, man. Everything's good. Dude, life's been busy. I have never moved. So it's been a long time since I've moved multiple people at the same time. Last time I did this, I was in high school. And I moved, I helped my family move from one side of town to the other, about 20 minutes away. So I was I was in high school, but it's not like it is as you're an adult and you're preparing to get married and you're moving your fiance's things and your things at the same time. And what do you think is going to be a process that fits a certain time schedule? It does not fit that time schedule at all. <laughs> and so I'm sitting here like, man, like it we moved and then with the second day we had to do some other stuff. I had to go back home to my previous home to do some stuff, and I'm like. This is a long, drawn-out, tiring process. And, Ryan, I'll say this now. The next time we move, my fiancé said it before I did. Well, my wife said it before I did. The next time we move, we'll probably hire movers. Because, buddy, at my age, I'm not built. I'm not like I was when I was 14, 15, 16 years old, man. I need somebody that does this at a professional level to help me move from this place to wherever we end up next. Oh man, Jay, I think I think we've moved three times at this point and we're in a ha- we're in a, a you know our, our I guess our dream house, I guess is how you want to kind of phrase it, right? And I'm just like I'm like Caitlin, we're we're staying here for 30 years. Like I'm not moving again, man. Like no more <laughs> box trucks, no more hand carts. Like I'm good, man. It stinks. It's not fun. Like moving is not a good time at all. So and, and it all I mean it always takes the entire day and then there's the I mean, if you rent like a box truck and stuff, it's like basically Tetris of like trying to fit everything into different spots. It stinks, man. It's not a fun time. No, 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 not at all. We ended up uh, renting um, a gutted out like van, like a cargo van. And we tried, we we did that just trying to be like, hey, like, let's save some money. Let's make some decisions that are better for us. We saved some money, but it was multiple trips. Now, granted, I, I lived an hour away from where we currently live previously, so my stuff all fit. It, I got rid of a whole bunch of stuff. So all my stuff fit in one area. My fiance, this has been recorded prior to the wedding. My fiance at the time was, she ended up having like all of like the bed frame and um, other, like the desk we're using now. Like she had all that stuff stored at her place. So it was multiple trips back and forth. And I'm like, no, nah, man, no, nah, I suggested movers <laughs> before. I understand why we didn't make it and use movers this time, but buddy, I would love to have a guy like Cage Stover helping me move. I mean, his growth and his uh, maturing at, at Ohio State. I mean, it seems like he's the kind of solid football player you want to say, hey, man, ditch the pads, ditch the helmet, come help out Ohio State podcaster move. Um, it's beneficial for everybody. So, I mean, if Cage Stover was on the moving team, buddy, I'd be straight. 
That's funny, man. That's a that's a, that's a wonderful segue because I mean, I one of the first things I would say about <laughs> Kate is like, he's just a grinder, man. Like, yeah, man. I mean, that's just kind of what he is, right? And and it's a fascinating backstory. I know we were talking a little bit before we started about this, but guy goes from defense to the offensive side of the football and usually when those transitions happen usually it's because you're trying to take advantage of athleticism and there's a lot of work that needs to be done from a technical perspective obviously but Kate's I almost called him Garrett Stover because Garrett Stover is going to Notre Dame I'm going to Ohio State in the 2024 class who's his cousin but Kate is uh, he is about as technically refined a tight end as I think you're going to find in the 2024 NFL draft class that I've seen I mean him and you know, a couple other guys like Brevin Span Ford out of Minnesota is a really good blocker. But like there's just not a ton of great blockers in the class because the one thing about this class, Jay, is like you're really talented receivers. I mean, you're going to talk about guys like Brock Bowers and Benjamin Urasek and Jatavion Sanders. And like there's a lot there's some talented tight ends in this group, but none of them are really blockers. A lot right. of those are, are like flexed out, big slots, playing to the boundary at times, movable chess pieces. Cade Stover is your traditional inline tight end. I mean, we got the Buster report back, and he's six three and and um, six three and seven eighths. I think it was what he was. So he's right around six foot four, two hundred fifty one pounds. So he's a really filled out frame, and he just brings a lot of physicality to the game. Man, he understands hand placement. He understands how to play with good pad level, attack leverage, and be able to run feet on contact and be an asset as a run blocker. So I think whether he's attached whether he's playing wing and doing some maybe some cross zone work i think he's going to be a really good blocker moving on to the next level and he's a pretty good straight line athlete you know i I don't i don't think that he's the greatest overall athlete of all time as far as being quick twitch and ability to change direction and all those great things but i think that in a straight line he is athletic enough to be an asset in the passing game at times on the next level so I really enjoyed his film, man. He's like one of those guys where some people might call him a slow burn process a prospect because like nothing about his game like pops immediately where you're like, wow, that guy is a crazy athlete. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, athleticism doesn't just jump off the film per se, but he just consistently wins reps, wins reps. He's just a good football player. And I think that there's a big spot for a guy like that in the NFL. NFL teams need guys like this. They need guys that can – Simply just be solid. Maybe not saying an all pro guy, but you need somebody who can be a tight end one or maybe even be a tight end two and say, hey, you're really good. You don't, you're not exceptional at the things we want our first tight end to be, but you're really good. You're solid, especially in the run game where it seems like it's harder to find guys. This isn't just a knock on tight ends, Ryan, but over the past five years, it seems like there's just been a lack of development at some and some college guys at just blocking in general, like run blocking. Or even pass blocking, you're either good at one, you're good at the other. But overall, yeah. it seems like it's a struggle. But when you limit guys on practice, when you limit how much they can hit, of course, that's going to be something that goes by and it's not worked on as much. But you need a guy like Cage Stover in your corner. And I put in the, in the notes on the side, the, the rundown for the show, just Cage Stover's growth. Because you mentioned him coming in being a defensive player. I believe it was a DN at one point. Um, linebacker, forgive me if I got one of the – I know linebacker for sure – um, tight end. He was just a guy that was just like, I'm a team guy. I'm good, but I'm a team guy. And for most guys, Ryan, if you say going into a bowl game, 2021 season, hey, week of the game, we got to make you change change positions. Most guys would be like, hey, man, look, I'm playing on offense. I, things are going well for us. Why make me change? But Ryan, going into the Rose Bowl, had to switch a linebacker and played very well, which goes into the yeah. growth that we have seen at tight end, but just him as an overall football player, it's just growth is the one word that speaks to me when describing what Case Dover does on the football field. Well, and I'll say this, Jay, I, I know that I was on the show when Jeremy Ruckert came out, obviously yes. a couple years ago. I like Stover a lot more than I liked Ruckert. Like I was not a big Jeremy Ruckert fan because I just didn't think that he did some of the little things as well, as far as being like a sticking point type of player. But this kid is a sticker, man. Like Cade Stover is going to make a roster in, for several years, in my opinion, in the NFL, because he has a baseline. The baseline is blocking. The baseline is strong hands. The baseline is he's also a team captain. Yes. And one thing that's an interesting thing is because I saw that the NFL, there's some like early three grades on him. So there's like some fourth round grades. So like the NFL likes him a good amount, obviously, at this point. 
But the cool thing for him is that also with that linebacker background, the defensive backgrounds, if I'm drafting a guy early on day three, he's going to have to play some special teams as well. He's going to have to cover some kicks, cover some punts potentially. And he has a defensive background. So obviously he knows how to tackle. He knows how to engage blocks. He knows how to get off of blocks. So that's a help to the sticking points. But I really think that a guy I wrote down was CJ Uzoma is a guy that like, he kind of reminds me a little bit of. There's nothing flashy about CJ who now plays with the Jets, played with the Cincinnati Bengals, but there's nothing flashy about him in the terms of pure athleticism, right? There's nothing that you look at and say, that guy should be a top 10 tight end in the NFL. But in any given year, he has an opportunity to be a productive pass catcher. I mean, a couple years ago with Cincinnati, he was a valuable member of that team that went to a Super Bowl and that had a chance to win a Super Bowl. But throughout his career, he's been kind of flexed between really good tight end two or low end tight end one, like trying to find that find that uh, sweet spot as far as his evaluation. And I think that's exactly what Kate is, man. Like, I think Kate is at worst – going to be a really good secondary option in a tight end room. But at best, could be a low-end starter, a guy that, again, isn't flashy, isn't sexy, isn't a guy that like is you know one of the Pro Bowl tight ends each and every year, but a guy that has some production, a guy that does the little things well, and a guy that helps you win football games. And there's nothing wrong with that, obviously. Our summer scouting series here on Locked on Buckeyes rolls on as we continue our conversation about Kate Stover and then jump into one about Julian Fleming that's coming at you next year on Locked on Buckeyes. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Take your first swing at betting Major League Baseball on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount and bonus bets up to two thousand dollars that's right just bet 20 bucks and you'll land two thousand dollars in bonus bets win or lose that's two thousand dollars you can spend betting everything from the money line to the over under to who you think is going to hit the first home run all on an app that's safe secure and super easy to use plus when you win you can get paid instantly there's no better place to bet on Major League Baseball than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $2,000 in bonus bets at FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Ryan, Kate Stover, the growth. But projecting him, let's say a year ago, not say let's say, this literally happened. A year ago, Kate Stover had a career high in receptions and receiving yards and touchdowns. Also caught his first touchdown as a a tight end a year ago. But he had 36 receptions a year ago, 406 receiving yards, five receiving touchdowns. Is it crazy to, to project that Kate Stover, in a way for him to easily raise his draft stock, catch 40 balls, between 450 to 475 receiving yards and six touchdowns. Is that an easy way for him to say, yes, numerically and statistically, he can raise his draft stock by hitting those milestones? Yeah, I think that it's a – because – so that production bump, slight projection bump, I think is going to be possible for him because I think that the one thing is obviously breaking in a new quarterback, breaking in, you know, obviously either – you know, two options that are on the board right now in in Kyle McCord or Devin Brown. Like, either way, young quarterbacks tend to really like big, strong targets in the middle of the field. Guys that your kind of dependability matters a lot. So I think that that bump, Matt, uh, could definitely happen. And I, But I think that the thing for me, Jay, is that he really needs to take a step forward as far as showing maybe a little bit more versatility in the passing game, right? Like, right now – I think that he is just a solid big body receiver that's going to run the vertically oriented routes because he has solid straight line speed and a big body, and that's kind of what he is. I have question marks about him being able to run a full route tree, be a guy that can play outside a little bit at times, could be a guy that plays in the slot and can consistently win in one-on-one coverage. Like I just don't see that type of player right now in film. So if he can come out this year and show that, hey, I can uncover against man coverage a little bit more than maybe you think. I can line up in a couple different spots. I think that's the biggest bump to him. So it's not even a production thing as much. It's more of showing the versatility as a pass game weapon. Because I think there's versatility as a blocker right now extensively. Like I think that he can be in line. He could be a guy that plays an H, can move around a little bit, that can play a wing. Like He can do all those types of things. 
showing versatility in the passing game, I think could be a big weapon and he's going to have opportunities. I mean, he's a decent grade right now from the NFL. He's also a guy that I would guarantee is going to be at the senior bowl next year, like Mm, absolutely guarantee. And in those types of settings, if he shows the ability to get in and out of breaks, run some routes and create separation, he's got a chance to bump. You know, like I said, early day three grades is kind of what the NFL has on him right now. Would I be shocked if come April he's a third round draft pick? No, I wouldn't be shocked at all. I wouldn't be shocked at all because that that sticking point is really nice. The floor is really good. And if he shows that there's any more upside in the passing game more than what we saw in 2022, then it's certainly possible. A guy that you talk about versatility and kind of showing some upside or even just some better play, so you describe some things with Stover, the saying not so much statistically, but things on the field. If we see these things, the bumps in just his play being more versatile, that'll help him raise his draft stock. Julian Fleming could be somewhat similar as far as like, is it versatility? Is it things that you need to see on the field? Is it numerically, statistically? I think for Fleming and Stover, it's very similar. Fleming needs to show some of the same growth on the field even if the numbers are very similar from a year ago, if you show some of the growth in just like route running or whatever yeah. it is, sometimes catching crucial balls, doing those little things better on the field is a great way, Ryan, I think for Julian Fleming as well to raise his draft stock. Well, I mean, I, Ohio State's had some of these guys in the past, right? Where it's like, yeah, maybe they're not the sexiest guy of all time. I think of like Noah Brown when he came out of I Ohio State. I think about him right? as well. Right, like he, he was just a good football player, right? Yeah. Like there was nothing crazy about him. He was never going to be a number one receiver on the next level like a Garrett Wilson or a Chris Olave or a Marvin Harrison Jr. Or like somebody like that. But he ends up sticking on a roster in the NFL. He ends up being a solid football player when you need to go to him. Like that's kind of the players that I think about when you talk about just kind of the, the depth pieces. Because I think that's what Julian Fleming is ultimately. And he needs to be productive. He needs to be a guy, and I think that you said it perfectly, in the crucial moments, in the money downs, that's when Julian Fleming needs to make some plays. Like the guys that that on the end of the roster, but when you need a reception, you could be you could depend on him. That's what his game needs to be because there's a solid baseline here of athletic traits. Like he's six foot one and five eighths, so almost six foot two, two hundred eleven pounds. So he's got a pretty good frame, pretty good size. Four or five flat expected 40 yard dash time. So he's got solid speed. Again, nothing crazy. Nothing. This isn't Garrett Wilson speed. This isn't Chris Olave speed, but it's solid. It's not bad. But I think the things that you look at at him is he's a, he needs to be a technician. He needs to be a guy that does the little things well. And I think that he is a pretty good route runner. I think that the Brian Hartline tutelage has helped in that regard, but there's nothing flashy about him. I don't think he's a guy that's ever going to be a consistent separator on the next level. I think he's a guy that needs to run a varied route tree. He needs to do little things, and he needs to catch the ball consistently. If he can do those things, he could stick. The NFL, again, they have draftable grades on him right now, right now where we are sitting here today. So it's very possible that he does end up being a stick player on the next level. But he needs to show a higher level of consistency and a higher level of when I need a reception and you're open – need to be able to make that play all the time. Like you need to be able to. The guys that just move the chains, move the chains, move the chains. Julian Fleming needs to be that type of player because I think that he's a solid overall talent, but I don't think he's a great overall talent. So like he's just a solid to good overall talent, and that type of player needs to be able to be that money player when his number is called upon. Ryan, I often say and look at guys and their eligibility that they have left to play college football – and I'm always somebody that says a lot of guys don't need to come out when they're immediately draft eligible. Now, Flimmy could have come out at the end of this past year being draft eligible. Didn't make sense for him to. I think if he plays in 12, 13 games in the upcoming season, maybe longer, the Buckeyes go to the national championship. Even if he sees some growth, maybe it might not be as astronomical as some Buckeye fans would want or even some draft analysts like yourself would want to say, yes, yeah. go to the NFL. He could stay in school at the end of the offseason and come back to Ohio State. So I understand this is a 2024 draft conversation, but Ryan, I think Fleming's one of those guys that if you don't see the growth or even like catching the crucial balls or the raise in the draft stock that you might want to see, Fleming could be a guy that's at Ohio State during the 2024 season because this 2023 season may not have been good enough for him to go to the NFL draft next year. And honestly, Ryan, I don't have a problem with that. Like I get I, some guys, I think leave um, too early. I think some guys stay in school too late. 
Yeah. I think some guys need to stay a little bit longer, like a Kate Stover, to keep moving up draft boards. And Fleming could be the same way. He could be at Ohio State for two more years, and that could be perfect for him as being the perfect prospect that he will be whenever he leaves Columbus. You know what's what's interesting about that conversation, Jay, because I don't disagree. He might be a guy that, you know, the longer you stay, the better chance you have of developing into that guy. But the, the like, double-edged sword mm-hmm. here is, right, mm-hmm. is that – Marvin Harrison Jr. and Mecca Buka, you know, those are your guys this year, right? Julian Fleming is trying to be a really good number three option. But the problem is, is that you have some freshmen that are coming in that are going to be biting at his heels. So if he gets passed up by one of those guys, or if going into the 2024 season, right, kind of flash forwarding to a second, he has a worry of like, man, Cornell Tate, Brandon Innes, like they might pass me up a little bit. It's like the number one option, right? Like they might pass me up. I wouldn't even be shocked if he ends up being a transfer option at that point, right? Yeah, of like, yeah. let me go to a different school, make sure I'm the number one receiver where I don't have to just compete with so many mouths to feed. Cause I know we're, I know you're excited, especially about the wide receiver group yes. that's coming in, in the 2023 recruiting class. It's already on campus. Most, uh, all of them are on campus now because the, even the regular enrollees mm-hmm. are now there obviously in June. So very talented group that came in and there's a possibility though of like might get passed up by a couple young cats and if that happens even if he's not leaving for the nfl he might have to leave in general because there just might not be enough balls to go around man like that's the tough part of this sometimes so think about this we saw this recently at ohio state we saw 2020 games with williams alave and garrett wilson play together 20 the offseason going into the 2021 season Jameson Williams, I believe that was that offseason, wasn't it? Wasn't that when Williams transferred? Yeah. So he transfers to Alabama, yep. raised his draft stock, ultimately sure goes down, and I think if he was healthy, Alabama has a chance of winning the national championship. Like, there's a legitimate argument to be made, to be made about that, but we saw Williams, who I think he realized in Jigba was the next guy up. Like, as good as Olave and Wilson were, they kind of realized the offense was going to be not catered, but at times at crucial moments, and Jigba would be the go-to receiver for CJ Stroud, great, it happened. Yeah. Lenny could be the same way. And I I told Ryan Preacher I wanted to throw the freshman receivers in. I had no idea that from the conversation I just made, <laughs> the statement, I had no idea Ryan would pull that pre-show conversation to the end of this show in that way. But I, I do get it, Ryan. Like, as much as I don't like how the portal is utilized in a big grand scheme, big picture utilized mm-hmm. for a lot of guys, I think Fleming is a guy that could utilize it in a big way even though it would be like, hey, I have one more year of eligibility left, he is a guy that's like, hey, if I transfer, and maybe he is able to go to a Alabama, a Georgia, a USC. Maybe he goes down to Texas and plays with Quinn Ewers or Arch Manning and just balls out. Maybe that's what happens. I don't know. But for him, I, I could easily see a scenario where 2023, things don't move in the way he wants to go. He stays in school, transfers, goes to another elite power five, it balls out there. We've seen it once with Jameson Williams. I think you can see it again with Julian Fleming. And I don't have a problem if he decided to stay in school. Ryan, I want to do something quickly, more projections, more of the college football fan or analyst that Ryan Roberts is. I want to tap into also your recruiting expertise as well. We mentioned Ennis, Tate, the two Rogers boys. We rarely mention Jaden Ballard as far as somebody who could take over some of the reps and plays that Fleming gets. So if you have Jaden Ballard or any of the four freshmen, let's just not go with any of the other guys, Jaden Ballard or any of the four incoming freshmen, who are the most likely guys to take some of Fleming's plays if Ryan Hartline says, hey, look, we're going to work in a few guys in that third role, Fleming, and then who are the other guys that are right there? Well, I, I think in 2023, the answer is Carnell Tate, most likely, and then maybe Noah Rogers in that instance. But I think it's Carnell mostly because he's an early enrollee, mm-hmm. which is very important. Yes. And, I mean, if you watch Carnell, because he's originally a Chicago guy, but then he went down to IMG Academy. If you had seen Carnell in high school, which I know you have, very technically sound and very, very nuanced for his age, yes. man. He he knows how to play the position. He knows how to play. He knows how to run routes. He knows how to play with extension. He's pretty long. He's a good athlete. Like, Carnell is just a, a good football player. I do think that there's a couple other wide receivers in the 2023 class that have a higher upside than Carnell Tate, but I think Carnell's floor is like, like – 
so high, man. Like he's going to be a really good football player at Ohio State. I think at bare minimum. So seeing what he did in the spring, transitioning into the offseason, he would be my pick for 2023, followed by Noah Rogers, because Noah Rogers was also an early enrollee, and I think that stuff matters. But if you're asking me long term, because I know you're yeah. asking more short term questions, but yeah. long term, who do I think is going to be the best of the group? I think it's going to be Brandon Innes. I do. I, I was a big Brandon Innes guy coming out of high school, man. Like, I think that that kid is not the biggest dude in the world. Like, he's only about six foot, 190 something pounds right now, but he is special, man. Yeah. Like, he's just a special kid. He, his route, his releases at the line of scrimmage for his age are just dumb. Like, it doesn't make any sense. I saw him down in San Antonio at the All American Bowl with my own eyes. I'm just like, that kid just has a clear understanding of how to play the position. He's twitched up. He's athletic. He's explosive. He can win in every area. I think he can win short, intermediate, deep. And I also think that he could win after the catch. Big Brandon Innes guy. So long term, I would take Brandon Innes. But if you're asking me 2023 of taking reps from Julian Fleming, my answer would be Cardinal Tate just because of early enrollee. Brandon Innes did not enroll early, which I think hurts him a little bit in 2023. But Cardinal Tate is a, just that high floor player that like, we're going to be talking about him in two years. Like, we're going to be talking about him. He's going to be three and done at Ohio State, most likely. Like, he's just going to be a really good football player. I think Ennis has a chance to be better, but I think that Cornell Tate is – he's a future NFL player. Like, I, I don't think there's any doubt. It's always fun having Ryan on, and we're almost done with the offensive players as we're going through it. I didn't really realize this, Ryan, before when I hit you up initially. There's – Three offensive linemen we're going to talk about, and one guy was not a consistent starter in 2022, which is why it's going to this conversation is going to be so much fun. Defense is every position as well, and so I'm looking forward to more of these shows with Ryan, summer scouting, and uh, getting Ryan's thoughts and ideas about uh, Buckeye players and where they might go in the next NFL draft. Ryan, if you could let everybody know where they can follow you on Twitter, watch your show, listen to the podcast, or read some things about Notre Dame recruiting as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jay, I really appreciate it, man. I'm really excited to dig into the defense this year because we get to talk about Josh Proctor for the fourth straight year now, which is just absolutely fantastic, man. I can't believe Josh Proctor is still in school, but that's another conversation <laughs> for a completely other day. Uh, Rise and Draft, R-I-S-E, capital N, Draft on Twitter. If you all want to just get some NFL draft takes and kind of pumping out some uh, – some takes recently because obviously got the blessed old list, got some heights, weights, some verified measurables, kind of teasing a little bit of some of that stuff. First team college football and NFL draft podcast on Believe Podcast Network. If you all want your daily fix, we're working through every position, summer scouting portion of the of the conversation, obviously, for the podcast so far. And then IrishBreakdown.com if you guys are interested in what Notre Dame has cooking you know, cooking up this year because obviously game five of the year, it's going to be a massive one against Ohio State and Notre Dame after Ohio State obviously took the game last year 21-10. Notre Dame's coming back and trying to obviously be on the right end of that win-loss win this year. So thank you all, as always, for listening. Jay, thank you for having me on, man. I really do appreciate it. And, guys, you can follow me on Twitter at jsteven07. Send all of your emails to jstevens317 at gmail.com. We're out of here on a Monday. Tomorrow is a holiday, and there will still be a show coming your way. As long as there's no Wi-Fi outages or power outages or anything crazy going on, there will be a show tomorrow. Guys, out of here on a Monday. I am Jay Stevens here. Follow me on Twitter. I'll get more active and be interacting with you as well. I'll see you next time.